the station. Any unattended articles are likely to be removed without warning. This is the Hour of History Cities podcast with your host, Stephen Bauman. The Hour of History Cities podcast, as well as other Hour of History podcasts, can be streamed and downloaded at hourofhistory.com, iTunes, Google Music, our YouTube channel, and tune in. Be sure to also check out our Hour of History blog at hourofhistory.com forward slash blog. And now we begin the Hour of History Cities podcast with your host, Stephen Bauman. Hello, and welcome back to Cities in History. This is part of the Hour of History podcast, and I'm your host, Stephen Bauman. And for this 10-part series, I'm talking about Havana, Cuba, an important city in the Caribbean and an important city in the world. And part of this series, the goal is to talk about how cities impact the world and how cities are an excellent way to study some of the main features of history. Now, Havana's not only an interesting city that's captured the minds of authors like Ernest Hemingway, and it's been in the news time and time again. This year, President Raul Castro says he's going to give up power and the center of government is in Havana. But Havana has a long history, and last week we went back and talked about how Christopher Columbus landed in Cuba, how the Taino were quickly expelled, and how Cuba started to grow as this Spanish imperial outpost that connected the gold that was taken from Central and South America to the old world and to the people who were making big money, the Spaniards, off in old Spain. So my two items were the palm tree, a symbol of royal Spain in the New World, and the gold coin, a Spanish, so the way Spanish traded and the economy grew in Havana. Now, I ended last week with a Bible, biblical psalm, Psalm 48, a psalm that extols the greatness of a city. The reason I did this is because both the idea of a city growing is and is central to the Spanish colonization project, as well as the idea of the growth of religion. Spain was given the right to half the world in the Treaty of Tordesillas when the Pope split the world basically in two spheres and said everything to the west of this line is Spanish, everything to the east of this line is Portuguese. And it was up to the Spanish and the Portuguese to colonize the world. For that reason, most of Central and South America are Spanish-speaking because they were colonized by the Spanish after that Treaty of Tordesillas. So not only did Spain want to find glory for its monarch, not only did it have people who wanted to be rich, but also a central tenet of the Spanish Empire was creating glory for the faith, glory for the Catholic Church, and glory for Rome. So I return to that psalm that says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised is the city of our God. Now, of course, this probably refers to different cities, but, but it, explains, it explains that cities are sort of a great place where there's some sort of religion, religious center happening, and that these giant cities that are built are built in praise to God. And so I want to keep with that theme this week as we look at two items that sort of tell a very different story of the colonization of Cuba, of the Spanish New World, and of the growth of Havana. So the first item I'm going to start with are something that might seem distinctly unreligious or irreligious, but were central to the colonization project, and those items are shackles. Shackles that kept human hands in them, that uh, enslaved people, and that were central to the growth of not only Havana, but many cities in uh, the West that were colonized by the Spanish and eventually the English and other European powers. So by 1600, Fan Havana's uh, founded in 1514, but it's not the central, it's not the most important city of Cuba. But by 1600, nearly 100 years later, um, Havana is a relatively important trading post because of its nice natural harbor. So the Spanish want to uh, take ships and reload them, trade 
store gold, send gold back to Spain, all through a stop over in Havana. In order to protect that gold, one of the things that's necessary are soldiers. So some of the first constructions around this city, some of the ways the city is built up, are through the development and growth of forts. So ships come to the city, they're in the harbor, there's people that are going to have to be there in order to trade, there's people that are going to have to be there in order to process and record the gold. So ships stay in the harbor, forts need to be built in order to protect the harbor, and in order to staff the forts you need soldiers. Now, one of the reasons the forts were built, they weren't built right away, but in 1555 and so on and so forth, there's numerous, numerous times that Havana is attempted to be uh, taken by pirates. Pirates typically come into these harbors and these ports, take as much gold as they can, set things on fire, and leave. These are the pirates of the Caribbean. And the Spanish are not going to just lie down, so forts are constructed and soldiers are brought. So. Nearly 500 soldiers call Havana home, at least, or a posting, um, by 1600. And when you have soldiers, this sort of brings a need for further development. So soldiers live in the fort, but they need uh, weapons manufacturing. They need food. They need basic services in order to survive. So these forts bring soldiers, and the soldiers need services. So one of the ways the Spanish get services in places like Mexico is through enslavement of the indigenous population. In this case, Cuba is a little different because it didn't have a massive indigenous po population and the Taino, who were predominantly in the eastern and the southern part of the island, simply aren't in Havana. There aren't a lot of indigenous in Havana. So one of the solutions to this problem is the Spanish begin to import slaves from Africa. First they try to import indigenous uh, peoples of Mexico and um, enslave them, but they don't get the kind of work that they're looking for. So the Spanish go and begin to uh, buy slaves from the Portuguese traders in Africa and uh, send them to the New World. So a lot of these services in the young emerging city of Havana are provided by enslaved labor. So the transition from just this imperial outpost to a sort of pre-industrial city is really on the back of slaves. So wherever soldiers are surviving, uh, there's going to be slaves there providing services. So as the 16th century starts, there's as many as three times as many slaves as there are soldiers in Havana. So you can imagine about 500 soldiers, then there's going to be 1,500 slaves. And it continues to grow. So as the development grows, as the city becomes more populated, uh, more soldiers require more uh, slaves, more services, which the services are given by slaves. So you can see in early maps, the central locations are usually the forts, and those forts are from where the city grows. So just a couple dates. In 1514, Havana's founded. In 1563, so nearly 50 years later, Havana becomes the capital of Cuba, or the location of the Spanish governor of Cuba. So previously, the governor of Cuba had been in the city in the south, Santiago, um, and Santiago was sort of the central trading post. Christopher Columbus lands uh, in the southeast, and that's sort of where settlement begins. That's where most of the Taino are. In 1563, the governors moved from Santiago to Havana. And from that point, Havana really becomes the central and most important outpost for Spanish Cuba and for, uh, for, the, for Cuba, really. And <laughs> for the next 500 years, Havana is going to be the most important city. By 1580, La Fuerza, the most important fort of Havana, is completed and it really starts to pick up speed and develop. In 1592, the king of Spain declares Havana officially a city. There's enough people there. 
So that first item, the shackles representing the labor of the city. Now I started talking about Psalm 48 and the importance of religion. So how does slavery play into religion? Well, it's there to sort of uh, show a contrast between the, the two sort of operations here. The Spanish are trying to grow an economy and they're willing to do it with slave labor. At the same time, they're trying to grow Christendom. So my other item is a cross. I would choose a cross that uh, it's Cruz de la Parra. Uh, Columbus established allegedly these 13 or 14 crosses in the New World when he came. He left crosses where he where he landed, and one of them exists. It's allegedly the oldest artifact from Christopher Columbus in, and it's currently in um, Cuba. They, when Pope John Paul II came to Cuba, it was offered by Fidel Castro as a gift to. Rome, but it was refused, so it's still in Cuba, and it's just a simple wooden cross that is that is constructed from um, wood in Cuba. So the reason I choose that is because of the growth of Catholicism. After the soldiers, after the slaves, after the protection, and after the services have been developed in the city, the city turns to religion. So in 1576, just before Havana becomes an official city, um, King Philip II commissions the building of a church in Havana. So th there were probably smaller churches, maybe priests that came on the voyages, but this he uh, Philip II is asking for a big church and a Franciscan monastery to be built because he tells the governor of Cuba that material and moral work must be done in Havana and Cuba. So this Franciscan monastery is built, a church is built in the center of the new city, and not to be outdone by their rival orders, soon later follow the Dominicans. The Dominicans also establish their own monastery and church in Havana, and the Jesuits build a school. All this happens before the the before Havana is even a city. So the be beginnings of this city are built around these sort of three things, protecting the Spanish gold, uh, building services for these soldiers to make sure Spain has soldiers that are well taken care of, and that's done on the backs of enslaved people, and then building this sort of religious foothold for Christendom in the New World. And it, it's pretty uh, apparent to see the importance of the church when you look at maps uh, the church is almost always in a central location. So one thing to consider when studying cities is what's in the center of the city? This is a question that many urbanists, many city planners have obsessed over for, for ever since we've had real city planning in the post-industrial era. And even before there was city planning, um, what is going to be in the center? What's the most important thing in the center? And Havana Harbor, the actual harbor where the ships are, is blocked off by the forts. So the forts are blocking any ships from coming in and out. But where the city begins, outside the fort, what's in the center? And for the Spanish Empire and for the case of Havana, in the way you might imagine a medieval Europe town or any European town that you might see in modernity, you can still see sort of remnants of this, the church is going to be in the center. And it's not only in the city, even in the forts, even in the fully, um, the fully walled off forts that are not necessarily part of the city that uh, slaves might not have access to, but certainly help to build, there are monasteries and churches in those forts. Now, interestingly, when you look at the maps of the city, the church is in the center of the city. But when you look in the maps of the fort, it's usually a church off to the side or a chapel or a monastery off to the side. When it comes to protecting Havana, there is not much hesitation to uh, sort of push the church aside, just like some of these ideas of using slaves um, for service industries really take precedence over establishing the church when the Spanish first get there. So we now have four objects and we're not even yet to the middle of the 1600s. So we've got a lot of time to cover and I hope I'm not using my objects too fast. I'm gonna do two objects a week and I'm going to talk about Havana for 10 weeks. Um, as 
always, please subscribe to Hour of History. This is just one program of many that we like to bring you. Uh, take time to subscribe to us on YouTube, on Google Play, on iTunes. We're on all of the above. And feel free to send me an email or leave a comment on any cities or topics that you'd like to hear. Thanks for joining us. This is Cities in History. Thank you.